A warm welcome everyone, um, especially any of you that are here for the first time joining us for um, our lunchtime talks. If you were here yesterday, apologies for the um, technical, some of the technical difficulties we had, but um, I hope that you're looking forward to hearing um, Dr. Mike Sweet's um, talk coming up shortly. Joining me today from the committee is um, our Vice Chair Mark Vassanavant, who teaches at Uppingham School. He did introduce himself yesterday. And um, Dr. Jeff Buck, who is um, our Treasurer on the East Midlands Committee. So uh, a very warm welcome to everybody and uh, thank you for joining us today. Right now to Coral. Um, please can I introduce, or I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Michael Sweet, who is Associate Professor in Aquatic Biology at the University of Derby. So uh, welcome, Mike, and thanks very much for agreeing to come along and give us a talk. Thank you very um, much for having me. I'll just say very briefly, I forgot to say, for those that anybody that's new, um, we are uh, keeping you all muted and your videos off because the talk is being recorded. And uh, nevertheless, we would like to encourage you to use the chat function, obviously at the end for questions, but Mike may hope that you will do it in between as well. So I'll leave you to it, Mike, but thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so for those who know me know that me trying to, to keep to a time limit is often quite a challenge. So uh, that's going to be the thing I need to, to focus on for the, for the time being. Um, but I do like to make uh, my sessions and, and my lectures uh, interactive uh, and also discuss uh, certain aspects. Um, so I will be asking a few questions uh, to the groups. Uh, and then if you uh, type in uh, any answers which are either shouted out or, or which you have uh, specifically, uh, then I'll read them out and we can discuss those as we move forward. Um, so as Rosemary uh, noted, uh, my name is Michael Sweet and uh, strangely, I'm a, a coral biologist uh, based in Derbyshire. So she wanted to uh, allow me to quickly introduce myself and, and how I even ended up uh, studying coral reefs uh, in the, the middle of the UK. Uh, one of the furthest places from tropical coral reefs uh, that you can have. And it, it was a bit of a, a convoluted uh, story. I, I studied up at Newcastle, uh, an undergrad in zoology, um, but always loved marine biology, uh, more of a hobby. Um, and then I started traveling the world. I spent four years actually uh, working on uh, a lot of different projects uh, from uh, rhino, tracking rhinos in Sumatra and Borneo, um, to doing biodiversity indexes in the Philippines and Malaysia. Uh, working with the most endangered bird, the black robin in New Zealand, uh, monitoring and tracking uh, whale sharks in Australia, um, Goldian finches also in Australia, and then uh, managing uh, nature reserves and doing biodiversity indexes uh, throughout a number of countries in Africa, including Madagascar. And then suddenly I thought I needed to do a PhD uh, and my old supervisor had one on corals and it seemed like a, a good a, good a topic as any um, and it sort of stuck uh, and my love for, for all of life but particularly marine life uh, has blossomed since uh, uh, specializing in this particular area. So a bit of a, a weird way of getting there um, and then Derby offered me a full-time job um, and it allows me to take my students to, to wonderful places like the Maldives uh, to, to try and uh, instill my passion uh, for, for places like, uh, like, like tropical oceans um, to, to the students who come and study uh, biology and zoology at Derby now. So hopefully some of you guys who are listening uh, might uh, have that same passion uh, after listening to this and I might get to see you uh, in the latter years. Um, what I wanted to, to start this talk off, so obviously we're going to look at the adaptive capacity of coral reefs to survive climate change, uh, but I thought I'd start really basic and then build ourselves up as far as complexity is concerned uh, till we get some sort of hard hitting uh, terms and, uh, and uh, uh, terminology uh, to actually explain uh, what I'm actually trying to get to uh, in this point. So my first point was uh, wanting to know how much of you guys or, or who uh, knew what corals actually were. And I used to play a game uh, probably when I was younger than, than most of the audience in, the, in this talk uh, called Animal, Vegetable, Mineral. It was actually a 1950s uh, TV show and some, some people are probably nodding, uh, thinking about uh, those, those good old days. 
uh, and it was a really good uh, car game we used to play where you used to think of a, a of a, an animal or a vegetable or a mineral or a plant or anything um, and then you'd have the other people would have to guess so my question to you to start this off is is what is coral is it an animal a vegetable or a mineral if anybody wants to to throw in in the chat uh, what they think uh, we can then uh, start this off so uh, paul's going for animal it's a good start strong start from paul do we have any advances on animal <laughs> it knows they're alive that's a that's a very good start christine has not fallen for my trap and she jumped straight in there with all three you've ruined it all for the rest of us and that's exactly uh, what they are and that and that's a, a really good foundation block so i've got some uh, good examples here uh, so here's uh, a coral so it's a coral skeleton in a similar way as if i held up uh, the the uh, skull of a human uh, that's what forms uh, things like the Great Barrier Reef, one of the, the greatest uh, living uh, structures on our planet. They all come in a whole heap of different shapes and sizes. Uh, this is a Montipora coral, a plating coral. And then we have our typical branching corals like this, uh, which are from the genre of Cropera. Uh, so a really uh, diverse group uh, of individuals. And that's the coral skeleton. So that's the mineral that's made of calcium carbonate skeleton. But as Paul stated, uh, there is an animal part of that as well. It's an invertebrate. Uh, so you get this polyp structure associated, and that's the animal. But as Christine alluded to, there's also this vegetable or plant aspect, and that's algae, uh, which live inside the coral. And you can, you can relate it very similar uh, to the chloroplasts of trees. So obviously the chloroplasts are photosynthetic algae. They're, they're gathering energy uh, from the sun. Um, and actually the algae in corals uh, give 80% of the entire energy that's needed for, for skeletinian corals. These are corals which uh, produce these calcium carbonate skeletons and they, they uh, give 80% of the needs. The animal itself, which does something called heterotrophic feeding, grabbing food from the, the water column, is only supporting itself with 20% of the needs uh, that it has for an animal itself. So most people would jump on as, as Paul did uh, and state animal right from the onset. Um, but strangely, they have been classed as, as rocks before. Um, and for, for a long time, they never reached the IUCN endangered list uh, because many people said, why, why are you putting a rock on an endangered list? Um, so if you speak to a lot of people, uh, quite a few people will, will not actually understand that it's a, it's a living organism. Did corals evolve before or after plants? That's a, a very good uh, uh, question. And the answer is probably uh, in, uh, in combination uh, with. So uh, skeletinian corals in particular have always evolved uh, with their, their plant counter counterparts. So um, it would have been a, a, a multiple evolution occurring at the same time in this instance. Um, so just trying to move my slides along. So this is a, um, a, a schematic, a, a drawing, uh, giving a, a relatively oversimplified view uh, of what a coral actually looks like. So if you sliced uh, a coral in half, um, and, and if it was a living coral, you would have a, a very thin layer of tissue over the top surface. Now, hopefully most of you can see the video as well as the, the screen as well. So this is called a brain coral because it looks a bit like a brain. Um, and you would have a very thin layer of tissue. And that's what actually gives the, the, the corals their different colors, browns, blues, reds, greens, a variety of different colors. Um, all coral skeleton, uh, apart from blue corals, uh, have a, a white skeleton. Blue corals obviously have a blue skeleton for reasons we don't need to, to get into. Uh, but this thin tissue layer uh, have these polyps, which you can see on the screen here. And those polyps are the animal part. But if you chop those polyps in half, then you actually see the algae which are in this uh, area, these are, these are called uh, diploblastic animals. We are triploblastic, we have three layers of tissue. Corals are diploblastic, they only have two layers. So they have an endoderm and an ectoderm, and then they have a thin layer called a mesoglia, um, which we, we won't uh, bore you with at, at that stage. Um, but it shows that they're an early metazoan, 
um, so early in the evolutionary history uh, to answer that question uh, from I think it was Paul who was asking uh, about uh, the, the evolution of, uh, of corals in, in general. And then we have these things called these thingy cells. So um, I, it's a, a very uh, naive term to use it, but they're actually called nematocysts. Um, and they're an important part of the phylum Cnidaria, which includes things like jellyfish as well. So jellyfish and corals are, are very similar in, in many instances. And also many jellyfish also harbor uh, their own symbiotic algae as well, called Symbididiaceae. Um, but they don't obviously have a calcifying skeleton, which makes the sort of separation in this instance. So I said it was an oversimplicated uh, view, uh, and that, that really was true, uh, because if we now start to get a little bit more complex, uh, we now need to think uh, about what a coral actually uh, entails in its entirety. So we've already mentioned that the coral is, is its animal part as well. Uh, we've got the skeleton and so on and so forth. And we've talked about the, the algae, which are called Symbididiaceae, or zooxanthellae is a sort of common term, which is sometimes still utilized. Um, but as with all organisms, uh, they also contain a, a large community of viruses, a large community of bacteria. They also have archaea, which are sort of primitive uh, prokaryotes as well. They have other types of algae called endolithic algae. So this lives uh, in between the, the skeleton and the tissue itself. They also have a large number of fungi, but these are usually undescribed and we don't really understand too much about the role of marine fungi in particular. And then they have a number of other proteists, which again are only starting to become uh, understood as we start to explore these in, in deeper. If you take all these in their entirety, it's called a coral holobuild or a meta-organism, super-organism, so to speak. And you are a holobiont and you are a meta-organism as well. In fact, 80% of you guys are not human at all. You're not made of human cells. It's only 20% made of human cells. The rest is all uh, prokaryotes, so all bacteria, archaea, viruses, things like that. Um, so we, we are all now wildly classed as being holobionts or metaorganisms. And corals is a really good example, like a model, if you will, uh, to illustrate uh, the importance of this. And we're going to circle back to this uh, as we uh, move through the lecture, because it becomes really important um, as we, uh, as you'll find out in the not too distant future. So corals are, are also special in my opinion, um, because not only are they uh, beautiful and a, and a fascinating ecosystem, uh, but surprisingly they only cover 0.1% of the ocean floor. So a really small amount. In fact, most of the ocean floor is actually deep sea ocean floor. So in the abyssal plains uh, or even the Hadal zone, which is in the real deep in the, in the trenches, um, like the Mariana Trench, uh, 11,000 meters deep. Um, but the, the, uh, the corals usually grow, most Scalpicinian corals grow in the tropics um, and they're only associated in the, the top 30 meters. You then go into mesophotic reefs, which are slightly deeper. So from 30 meters onwards to about 60, 70, 80 meters, uh, where light still penetrates, because remember if they've got photosynthetic algae, they need to gain that energy from the light. So they're dictated by the, the uh, the depth that light can actually penetrate in the ocean. Um, so a relatively small area uh, which they house. But coral reefs as a whole provide habitat for over 30% of all marine species. That's a staggering amount. So they, they are sometimes called rainforests of the sea, uh, and rightly so, uh, because they're vitally important ecosystems uh, for a lot of marine life, and particularly a lot of species which are valuable to us, like tuna, for example, for those who like their tuna sandwiches. If we didn't have coral reefs, we wouldn't have tuna because they act as a nursery uh, for many pelagic fish species. These are fish which actually routinely live in the open ocean, um, but have a nursery stage associated with reefs. If that's not enough to, to persuade you how important they are on a biodiversity angle, then over a billion people rely on them directly, usually as a form of protein, uh, but also uh, for other services, uh, particularly things like tourism and so on and so forth. So they have a global economic value of about 9.9 .9 trillion US dollars per year. That's pretty staggering. And this is a value which can be utilized when you're trying to say how important they are or how much we should uh, invest into trying to restore them or protect them, because this is the value they actually provide. If we didn't have coral reefs, we would have to find this extra 9.9 .9 trillion per year uh, to accommodate for the services they actually provide uh, humans directly, never mind the amount of staggering biodiversity we would lose in this response. And corals are threatened worldwide. 
So we now know quite uh, categorically uh, that they are in danger. Uh, we've written a recent publication which highlights that there are canaries in the coal mine. They're, they're singing um, and we need to listen and we need to act now. And this is uh, something that we, we spend quite a lot of time and energy on. Uh, one part is, is education, which is why I'm here today. Uh, but the other part is actually answering some of those unknown questions to try and really address uh, what's going on. So in 2015 to 2018, uh, this was a mass bleaching event. First one happened in the sort of 1980s when people, when scientists first witnessed uh, this thing called mass bleaching, which we're going to get onto in a minute. Um, then happened in 1998, another global scale bleaching. Again in 2010, uh, 19, uh, 2015 and 2018 was by far the most extended um, and uh, wide reaching bleaching event, where 75% of all reefs worldwide showed some signs of bleaching. This is where corals go paper white. So now you can see the calcium carbonate skeleton of the corals underneath. On the Great Barrier Reef, as I mentioned, is the largest living structure on Earth, uh, can be seen from space, like the Great Wall of China. 30% of coral cover was completely lost. That's unrecoverable or takes a large amount of time to recover if given the opportunity. And over the last 50 years in the Caribbean, uh, in the Florida reef tract, as it's called, coral covers have declined by 90%, making many coral species actually functionally extinct in the Caribbean. The Caribbean is suffering uh, a fate uh, that the Indo-Pacific will suffer in the next few years if we don't do anything about it. So what is coral bleaching? What do people understand that coral bleaching actually is? I'm sort of giving it away because I just moved on to the next slide, but how many of you have heard of the, the phenomenon called coral bleaching? Megan's heard of it. Does it mean they're turning white? Yep, yeah, so that, that's exactly what's happening. So if you remember back to what I said, um, You've got your coral skeleton, let's use this one as an example this time, and then we've got a thin layer uh, of the uh, animal tissue which goes over. When, uh, when, an anim when a coral dies, it leaves the coral skeleton. So it's the same as if you died, uh, you would leave your skeleton behind once your tissue uh, had been degraded by various other organisms. Um, what, when a coral dies, it uh, leaves paper white. When a coral bleaches, the tissue actually remains, so the animal part of the coral is still there, but it loses its symbiotic algae. How it loses its symbiotic algae is not uh, as quite an easy uh, question to ask. There's a numerous different ways that it can, can do it, um, but most people now uh, think that corals can actually retain a few uh, numbers, so it basically reduces the amount of algae it has. It gets rid of a lot of it into the water column because it actually becomes a hindrance rather than a help now. So this symbiotic relationship between the coral animal and the algae now becomes a hindrance and actually becomes poisonous. So there's this thing called reactive oxygen species, which actually builds up and becomes a toxic environment for the coral. So the coral needs to get rid of it when the, the actual environment has, has changed, usually associated with increases in sea surface temperature, which is linked to climate change, as we know. Um, and it becomes a toxic environment. So the coral gets rid of it in a last ditch attempt. The coral is still alive when it's bleached, and it's hoping to weather the storm, it's hoping that the environment returns back to its favorable conditions, and then it can regrow or retain uh, its uh, algal symbionts. So it can sometimes actually gain them back again from the water column, but some argue that it can actually just regrow them quite, quite extensively uh, from remnants of algae uh, left deep down into the tissue. So we can't physically see them, but they're still there. Um, and then it gets back to this normal health and it recovers perfectly fine. If a coral's got about a, a month or so uh, of just heterotrophic feeding, that's fine. It stops reproduction, it stops producing mucus, uh, stops growing, because these are all energy consuming things, um, but it, uh, it still survives and can retain. What usually happens is that in the, the, uh, the instances where we've got climate change, uh, these temperatures are, are so high and so prolonged, so they stay for a lengthy period of time, that the corals can't recover and eventually they die as well. Uh, so there's a couple of questions which I'm going to repeat in here. Uh, so is it the dying out of corals and killing of algae? It's kind of, you can relate it to the, the killing of algae and uh, it can be the dying of corals, but it's not uh, the actual finite aspect as I've just uh, highlighted. 
Uh, do natural disasters affect corals like tsunamis and volcanoes? Uh, tsunami, yes, definitely. Uh, so they can completely wipe out uh, corals. And th but these are all semi-natural processes. Sometimes they're exaggerated uh, due to climate change and, and human-induced uh, aspects of climate change. Uh, but a, a tsunami or a volcano coming through would be a perfectly natural process. And in fact, there's this thing called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, where to have a, an ecosystem uh, which is highly diverse, which is what a coral reef is, um, you actually need an intermediate disturbance to come in, wipe out some of the dominant species present in there, and it allows for other species to come up. So you get this high diversity associated with it. If you don't have an intermediate disturbance, then you end up with the dominance of one particular species or one particular group of animals. And this actually can reduce uh, the diversity of a particular ecosystem. So uh, an intermediate change like a tsunami or a volcano popping in every 20, 30 years or something along those lines, which naturally would occur, um, that would be fine. What's happening or the real problem is that with climate change occurring, it's these stresses and these impacts are occurring more frequently and for prolonged periods uh, that the corals just can't recover. If a coral reef was given about 20 years chance to recover naturally, uh, then it would get back to the sort of coral cover levels uh, that most people uh, would accept as a, as a healthy reef. Is the colour change result of their lack of plastids in the plant cells? No, it's actually the complete lack of the plant cells in the coral in this instance. Uh, you put that in the second comment as well. So the real threat, threat is definitely humans. Yes, uh, unfortunately and sadly, this is uh, almost definitely true. Uh, humans are, are, well, we, we can't say 100% because we don't have a planet B, uh, which has exactly the same planet and exactly the same uh, shifts and changes in the climate, uh, which we, which historically the, the Earth has experienced um, without humans. So all we can do is model the impacts of uh, humans, anthropogenic factors, um, have on, on, on our planet. And we're 95% certain, which is pretty good, uh, that humans are having a massive impact as far as the shifts and changes in climate. Uh, temperature is one of the key impacts associated. So Olin asks, uh, are the acidity and temperature responsible? Uh, ocean acidification is an interesting factor. I don't think we've really got time to, to drill into that, um, but we might deal with that as a question at the end. So put a pin in that one, Olin, um, because it's, it's not a, a simple answer. Um, obviously, because it's a calcifying organism, uh, the simple answer would be yes, it will have a problem in an acidified ocean. Um, any calcifying organism is going to struggle, uh, but they can actually regulate their own pH uh, for, a, for a period of time. So they, they can actually control that uh, to a degree. Temperature, on the other hand, is, is at the major stress because corals live at the thermal threshold uh, for all their organisms. They, they live right at the limit uh, of their life. And any shift and change from that, uh, usually an increase by one or two degrees only, uh, can cause a massive problem. Uh, for the order for the um, animals themselves. Uh, so I'm just going to admit Gemma for coming in. Uh, so this is what coral bleaching looks like. Um, and this is actually uh, an image I took in the Maldives a good few years ago, uh, which highlights quite nicely the, the shift and change. In the top part of the image, you've got uh, the, the coral itself uh, with its symbiotic algae. And you can see the, the sort of browny green algae uh, visually inside. Uh, and it gives that, that color. The bit below is the bleached coral. So you can still see the animal. It still looks healthy. It's still gonna be able to feed heterotrophically, grab food out of the water column, but it's losing uh, that energy. It's, it's only supplying 20% of the energy it actually really needs uh, to survive for any lengthy period of time. So bleaching, you have to be able to see that it's actually only the algae which are affected immediately. Um, if it's prolonged, then the actual animal starts to die because it, it just can't sustain itself. But if you see a disease, for example, then a disease will actually wipe out the tissue completely and leave just the bare skeleton behind. So the difference between uh, the bare skeleton um, and the tissue is you literally only see uh, what looks like a rock or a stone. So it's calcium garlic. Uh, right. So uh, one of the big problems is that we lose something. So these are uh, taken side by side on the same reef, um, but after a bleaching event. So on the, the left-hand side of the picture, or the right-hand side, depending on which uh, way you're looking at it, 
um, you've got a, a healthy coral reef, uh, lots of diversity, lots of different species, uh, lots of nice fish. On the right hand side, we've had a bleaching and, and possibly also a, a disease uh, die off outbreak, uh, which has decimated the, the populations of corals. It's usually indiscriminate as far as uh, the species which it attacks, but we'll, we'll come back to that as well uh, in a little bit later on. Um, and you can see that it's completely changed. Um, if this carries on, we also get what's called a phase shift, where we move into an algal dominated uh, reef structure. So we get a different ecosystem, but not as diverse and not uh, as important, probably, arguably, uh, as the coral reef would have been. So there are major implications as far as uh, the ecosystem services, but also the biodiversity loss associated with coral bleaching. So what can we do about it? And this is simply reduce our carbon footprint. So how could we uh, reduce our carbon footprint? Name some simple things uh, that we can do which reduce our carbon footprint specifically. This is the only real way, you can sugarcoat it as much as you want, uh, but this is the only real way we can actually uh, do anything to save uh, the planet we know and love. Renewable energies. Useful, yeah. We could have a whole debate about this. Stop burning fossil fuels, 100%, yep. Renewable energy is an interesting one because it's not as clear cut as that. The uh, amount of environmental damage uh, associated with uh, the, the rare minerals, the rare earth minerals needed to actually produce most renewable energy, like lithium batteries, for example, uh, is actually quite devastating. Um, they, they usually survive, uh, they usually are found in, in volcanoes, for example, uh, and miners will just chop off the whole volcano top and start mining the ground um, and it causes quite a lot of uh, ecological pollution in its own self. Stop deforestation, yes, yeah, stop destroying the lungs of our planets, uh, reduce pollution, human consumption, very good one, Alan. So simply put, um, we need to do uh, as much as we can really. We need to uh, reduce our waste. We need to recycle. Recycling is not the answer, uh, but it's a step in the right direction. We need to offset uh, our use of uh, carbon fuels. We need to reduce gas. We need to think more about uh, electricity. We need to reduce our, um, uh, our, our over-dependency uh, on, on cars in many instances. Uh, we need to think about uh, our fuel uses. Um, we need to take carbon out of the atmosphere by planting and preserving carbon absorbing plants. Very good, Olin. So uh, that's called carbon sequester. Uh, and things like seagrasses, which are next to uh, uh, corals, can actually be used as a really good way of sequestering carbon, re removing huge amounts of carbon from our atmosphere. So another example of preserving uh, a similar ecosystem, uh, but for the greater good. So simply put, you, you will have seen these slogans before, but refuse, reduce, reuse, repair and recycle are very important. You notice how recycle is right at the bottom because recycling doesn't actually uh, solve the problem in the first instance. Uh, the best thing to do is refuse and reduce and re reuse uh, if possible. And people are starting to, to get back to the nature of repairing things. If something's broken, your dishwasher or your washing machine or something like that, the tendency, if you've got the pennies, is to replace it and, and just buy a new one rather than possibly simply just getting someone in or, or fixing it yourself um, and then saving a huge amount on your carbon footprint with buying new apparatus in that instance. Um, so if we fix our carbon footprint, which is a big if because it doesn't look likely, uh, then we might be able to get back to this desired long-term outlook as the schematic shows. So we can have the importance of things like marine protected areas can play a role, uh, but if we don't deal with our carbon footprint, uh, then we're possibly a fighting a losing cause. And this is the sad state of reality. However, there are other options which we can actually start to explore. They're a little bit more drastic and they should work in tandem with us reducing our carbon footprint. But this is something that our research team uh, are particularly interested in, in focusing on. So the goal as with every restoration project in the world, is to try and either stop the demise of reefs, so to stop them from declining even further, or even better, restore them back uh, to something of what they used to be in the days of old. That might be a little bit more tricky, but if we can just stem the flow um, and help corals survive climate change, or even help corals adapt to climate change, then now we're talking about something which actually could be within reach of our 
uh, capabilities. So who recognizes this chap? He's a pretty famous chap. It is, as Elva suggests, Darwin. Olin's in there, Paul's in there, very good. It's good old Charles Darwin. So most of you will know uh, about this sexual selection um, and how evolution works uh, with regard uh, to males, females, for the most part, uh, having sex and passing on uh, genes, which are usually, and mutants in some instances, uh, which are usually adaptable and changed. This it works very well, um, sexual selection response of evolution, um, and has done nature very well for, for, for many, many years. If you're given the time and space to be able to do that. If you're not given the time and space to be able to do that, which some argue that the current rate of climate change and the shift and change we're experiencing is hampering uh, the ability of sexual selection to allow species to keep up, then we need to look at other things. And this is where our holobiont comes back into play. Because if, if you just rely on the animal part of the, the coral uh, to, to be able to evolve and adapt, it might not be able to do enough in the coming face of climate change. But microbes, bacteria, viruses, also the algae, the proteists, the fungi, the endolithic algae, the archaea, they can all reproduce much quicker. They can all uh, evolve and adapt much quicker, like within days, within hours sometimes. Uh, they're very, very rapid. And if they offer their evolutionary capabilities and their evolutionary power to the animal as a whole, to this holobiont, to this meta-organism, then that means that all animals, including us, can adapt much quicker than what we, what we would originally think in this sort of regard. So this is something which has relatively recently come uh, to the, the concept of, uh, of us, and it's just starting to be utilized in science and particularly in things like restoration of reefs. So what we now can do is we can look at short-term processes associated with uh, evolution and adaption and the capabilities for, for corals to evolve uh, in the face of climate change and coupled with their long-term genetic adaptations which are on the far right of this schematic and, it, and all variations in between that which then leads to certain aspects of other tools um, as somebody said in, in the chat uh, someone highlighted that uh, so it was Olin was saying that was checking and technology cannot really solve nature um, but in this instance sometimes application of, of what we know and, and using technology uh, can actually assist in many instances so I would uh, argue that we could actually start to, to look into this a little bit more using technology so it, for one example here is, is phage therapy in the left hand side and phage therapy was actually quite popular in the 1980s to treat diseases in humans um, and it was a different way of utilizing uh, viruses, which are phages, to target bacterial pathogens. So obviously we're fighting a, a, a viral disease at the moment, so that wouldn't work in that sort of context. But if it was a bacterial disease, uh, like Yasonis pestis, the, the Black Death, the, the plague, uh, then you could actually develop a, a phage or find a phage which naturally occurred, which would target just that bacteria from that particular pathogen, helpfully solving uh, the Black Death in this sort of instance. Technology crossed with biology to give us a solution. If we look at the bacterial communities and the algal communities, we can look into probiotics. Again, probiotics have been used uh, for centuries uh, to, to improve uh, fish farming and aquaculture. Um, and now we can actually utilize this on corals. We can find those good bacteria, like a yakult. If you neck down a yakult in the morning, that's you giving yourself a probiotic or a prebiotic uh, in the morning. We can do exactly the same for corals as well. Um, and it is all uh, an aspect of time and, and scale and how these all fit in. And this is what we are starting to accumulate. So to, to sort of round off uh, what we're talking about, these are the variety of different techniques and tools and technology which is available to us to actually fight uh, and help uh, corals in their, their own fight against climate change. So one aspect is uh, looking at a standardized way of looking at the, the variation and shifts and changes that corals actually exhibit and, and the responses they have to climate change, because all corals do show a response to climate change, but they're not all created equal, to use an animal farm quote by George Orwell. Um, 
So some corals will show uh, higher thermotolerance, so they can resist higher temperatures uh, than other coral species. It's not necessarily even just the species species things. You get different colonies in the same environment, uh, which appear to be more robust than others. And these are all things which scientists are now pulling on and, and delving into to try and understand, first of all, and then apply in a research focused uh, management strategy to, to try and help corals. You can do this thing called environmental hardening and selective breeding. So just the same as uh, cows and sheep have been selectively bred for years and dogs, we can do that with corals. We can find two corals uh, which do really well in higher temperatures, uh, but still don't have the trade-offs associated with evolution in this instance, so like lower reproduction, reproduction capabilities. We can breed those two corals, we can produce hundreds of thousands of juveniles, and then we can reintroduce them onto the reef, uh, providing a new habitat uh, of hardened corals which may survive climate change. We can capture genetic diversity from extreme environments. We can broaden resilience using probiotics. And we can now produce uh, some of the work we've done with some of my PhD students is mass production of ex situ spawning in the UK specifically. We spawn corals in, in Derby and we spawn corals um, in, uh, in, in uh, London in the Horniman Museum. Um, there are shifts in, in uh, the genetic aspect, so uh, someone's uh, highlighting that, Olin. Um, so there is aspects to, to talk about that, uh, that we, we are uh, causing uh, shifts and changes. We, we do actually, we've shown that it's feasible uh, to create hybrid corals from Singapore corals and Great Barrier Reef corals, which naturally wouldn't occur. We can do it. We still haven't answered the question of whether we should do it. That's a different question, um, and that comes into a sort of ethical aspect. Um, there is this thing called assisted gene flow, uh, a whole method called assisted gene flow, which is all about actually causing this uh, shift and change in genetic drift, uh, which Olin is referring to, um, and that can be a good thing, but it could also possibly be a bad thing, and we need to now try and understand what we should and what we could actually do and, and where they, they shift and change. On top of that, we're also not going to find one answer uh, which tackles everything. So we need to try and uh, have this sort of standardized analytical and decision framework uh, to support uh, these various uh, responses and, and methods. And this may very well vary depending on the actual location we're interested in. So you might find a solution which occurs in the Red Sea, which is the center picture here, um, might be very different than what happens in the Great Barrier Reef. And it almost certainly will be different than what happens in the, the Red Sea, uh, in the Caribbean, sorry, in the Caribbean, which is on the left picture, uh, because the Caribbean has completely different species than the rest of the Indo-Pacific. Um, also, the Caribbean has lost 90% of its coral for the, for the most part. So that we're already dealing with uh, an extreme uh, ecosystem collapse in one entire location uh, of, our, of our world, which we need, really need to think about and maybe throw every strategy we've got at it to try and save or salvage something which is going on. The Great Barrier Reef, the Red Sea, we might have a little bit more time. We might be able to play with things. We might be able to really work out uh, the best solution um, and ensure that we're not actually causing any more harm than doing any good. Obviously our intention is always to do good, uh, but sometimes humans do actually uh, cause more harm than they do good. Um, so, and, and on top of this, we need to also capture and centralize our data in using new ways of, of machine learning and things like that uh, to actually store the data in the first instance, make it available to everybody, make it available to the people on the reefs. It's all good and well for scientists to actually uh, do something and, and, and write a paper about it. But how many of you guys have read a scientific paper? I don't know. Maybe you could answer in the chat. Oh, there we go. Someone has. Olin has. Very good. Well done. Maybe you'll read some of mine at some point. <laughs> Personal lab there, there. Um, and but but not it's not really reached by the, the general public. So doing things like this is is a, is a key uh, aspect of, of getting that information out uh, to everybody and anybody uh, to first understand what's going on, then understand the potential of what we can do, and then we need to figure out how to actually do it uh, and, and then actually work it out and set. So Paul's read mostly ex, uh, extracts and things like that. Um, and, and then we, so the, the last sort of stop is to, to look at the future. So we, I brought in the importance of carbon, uh, of, of climate change and, and stopping our carbon footprint. 
And this red line is what would happen in, in, in sort of one of the best case scenarios or one of the most realistic scenarios. Um, the orange line is what happens in the worst case scenario. And in both instances, it's not looking very good. It's going to get hot um, and the earth is going to get hot. The oceans are going to warm, the land is going to bake, uh, we're going to get floods, we're going to get droughts. Um, everything has to shift and change. So reefs will change. This is undeniable. Um, a large amount of that is driven by what we've done. Um, but what can we now do to try and help corals uh, fight this? One of the big issues is if we completely stopped our carbon footprint now. So if we just overnight, someone clicked their fingers in a bit like a, a Thanos style uh, move, but we didn't kill everybody, but we just stopped our carbon footprint. Um, then uh, we would still experience exactly the same trends for about 40 to 60 years. So that's quite difficult to actually stomach and comprehend because we would stop everything. We'd stop driving everywhere. We'd stop flying everywhere, a bit like the pandemic, but for, for um, forever. Um, so it would really imp impact people's lifestyle. Uh, but we still would see the, the impacts of climate change for the rest of our lives, basically, um, and certainly going into the, the next generations. And that's difficult on a political scale, but it's also difficult on a personal scale to actually to take that sacrifice. Um, so as far as a coral is concerned, this could be a problem. This is the, this, this red zigzag line is, is, is the change in temperature. And this solid line is the thermal threshold of uh, a coral, for example. So in A, if we go past the thermal threshold of the coral, the coral dies. It's as simple as that. It bleaches for a little bit, but then if it doesn't go back, it, it dies. So every little, all of these little blips, that would be when the coral bleaches. But if it blipped back down below that line, it would survive. If the lines, if the red lines are always above uh, that threshold of the coral, it completely dies. But we knew quite early on that not all corals were created equal. So different corals had different thermal thresholds. That was good. And now we now start to think that many different species of coral will actually adapt themselves. Some we can actually help adapt, others might not be able to do anything. So we will lose certain species, that's for sure. We will lose the, the, the traditional structure of what a reef looks like, that's pretty much certain. But we won't lose corals, and that's something which I think is quite important uh, to actually allude to, is that corals won't actually uh, be lost, uh, but coral reefs as we know them are certainly suffering. And we're starting to see this. We're starting to see the shifts and changes. So typically, these uh, branching corals, as I've got an example here, these were the ones which were really suffering. They were the most vulnerable, the most sensitive to climate, and they are always bleached. These massive corals were the tough, tough ones. They could just withstand. But when you had one of these uh, vulnerable ones sat on top of one of these tough ones in this exactly the same environment as this picture suggests, it would usually be this one would bleach, this one would die, this one would bleach and maybe survive. But then, as you can see in this picture, we're getting the opposite in some cases, where the tough corals start to bleach and the, what were historically the, the, the more vulnerable uh, corals uh, were starting to survive. So adaption was naturally happening. And all we're suggesting is that we can actually uh, assist them. And it's called assisted evolution in many instances, basically captive breeding. And we're not going to solve the problem that way, but we can certainly give them a helping hand. So to, to finish up, I haven't been keeping an eye on my uh, time, but it's probably close to that. Um, so reefs definitely need our help. Corals will survive, but will reefs? And at least reefs as we know them today is a big question mark. There are strategies which scientists can employ, but we simply do not know if there's going to be enough. And um, will nature surprise us? Well, it certainly looks like it is. And will it show us how reefs can be, how resilient reefs can be? So what can you do? Well, this is the most important thing, I think, in, in, in my eyes. Uh, first, try and reduce your own carbon footprint. There's no point in just saying, I'm waiting for the government to make their decisions. I'm waiting for those big businesses to change their attitudes. I think it has to start at home. And I think we have to take ownership for our own carbon footprint and our own uh, future. Uh, and reduce this. So uh, even before COVID uh, came along, I had a New Year's resolution uh, that I would reduce my carbon footprint by 50%. It's probably been more than that because I used to fly all over the world for my field trips, 
and now for the last year and a bit, I haven't flown anywhere. So I think I've hit my target and then some, uh, but we do quite a lot of stuff at home to actually reduce our carbon footprint directly. Another option is to become a scientist. You could actually be the one coming up with the next best solutions to save these reefs. And we need people like you. And one of the other key aspects is educate others. This is one aspect which is a, a very important part. This is why I'm here today. And this is why I like to discuss with you guys. And some of the comments have come in of saying, how do we get that uh, across to people? And that's exactly uh, one of the challenges is to make sure that people know the issue, know the, the facts behind that, and make sure that it's all true and fact checked, but then to actually try and do something about it. So I leave you with the quote from uh, Babadion in 1968. So we knew this in 1968 and it's still very relevant now. In the end, we will only conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we have taught. So hopefully I've taught you a little bit uh, about climate change uh, using corals as an example and coral reefs. Um, and then hopefully you understand and you love that a little bit more and the importance of those. And it might encourage you to uh, become uh, a scientist or a, a researcher or a conservationist um, or even a, a bio innovator, um, which might make a bit more pennies, um, but still uh, have climate in your hearts and the importance of uh, conservation. Thank you ever so much, Mike. That was really brilliant. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to have a sneak preview of Mike's slideshow. Um, I missed all the good bits, obviously, of what he's told us today. And um, I'm sure we all wish we could sit here for a bit longer and ply some more questions and uh, get into some more discussion. It has been really good, but I'm afraid we won't be able to stop the questions because we said from the outset, this event would um, close promptly at two o'clock. So uh, I'm sorry to say that to everybody, but um, uh, maybe you can get in touch with Mike and um, send more questions his way, read some of his papers, whatever. But. Um, let's hope that we all make a genuine effort. Um, I love the quote, I told Mike that already, and it is up to us all as individuals to make a difference for the whole of the planet. So um, let's all make resolutions.